Psalm 141. And I catch my breath as I say that because it means we're now in the countdown to reaching the summit. You know, it's like getting to the top of Psalms and hopefully by getting to the summit, a perspective about the journey that we have shared. Psalm 141 asks, evokes the question of what's unique about it. And there's two things that are particularly distinctive to this Psalm. One second. Oh. The two things that are distinctive. One second. Um, the two things that I mean, the two things that are distinctive about Psalm 141 is an image, and that's the image of asking God to place a guard over the mouth of the psalmist. That doesn't appear anywhere else, though there are other psalms that ask and seek the ability to guard one's tongue. So Psalm 39, 2, Amarti, I said, Ashamra darkai mechota, I will guard my way from sin, bilashoni, with my tongue, ashamra lepi machsom, I will guard my mouth with a muzzle, bold resha lenegdi, lest there be any evil against me. And so the idea of the dangers of one's own tongue are part of Psalms. Yesterday, with Psalm 140, that was a psalm that focused on the danger of other people's tongues. And in that sense, there's continuity about tongue, speech, slander, and yesterday, how a tongue can lead to violence. But today, the focus is more on the psalmist in his own concerns that he won't be seduced by his evil neighbors who invite him to feast and fall into their ways. There's something else that's distinctive about this psalm, and that is the middle part of the psalm is particularly convoluted. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Is it due to scribal errors that the middle part of the psalm is so hard to understand, as if the grammar or words are misplaced, or is that part of the message? And I will look to unpack that. There are three parts to this psalm. Verses 1 to 4 opens 1 to 4, 5 to 7, and then 8 to 10. 1 to 4 and 8 to 10 are pretty clear and straightforward. Pretty, there's a little ambiguity, which is the nature of poetry, but overall it's pretty clear. The clarity of the first part, as you'll see in a moment, is a call on God that his words, his prayer, circle words, are honoree, Ras Ru, I'm so glad to see you. So the first part opens with, may my prayers be like incense to you. And that's a beautiful and also a distinctive phrase and a phrase that will make this psalm particularly popular in Christian evening prayers. Interestingly, it's not part of Jewish prayers, this psalm. So the beginning has, may my words be like incense to you. May my raised hands, my raised palms be like an offering of evening to you. And then guard my tongue. Put a protector before my lips. Radak will comment that 
a protector of the door of my lips, just like a door opens and closes, so does a mouth. And then verses five to seven, opaque, convoluted. And then the closing, the verses eight to 10, is a sense of enemies who seem to want to trap, entrap the Psalter. And we'll also look to ask, what's the relationship between the first part of the Psalm, which asks Gar to put a protector over his lips, and the last part of the Psalm, which is those who would seek to entrap me or trap me. With that, I hopefully have created some sense of both curiosity and confusion, which is the nature of this psalm. And so, Psalm 141. The title taken from verse 3, Place Adonai, a guard for my mouth. The Psalm of David, Adonai, I have called you, hasten to me, give ear to my voice when I call you, establish my prayer as incense before you, raising of my palms an offering of evening, place Adonai a guard for my mouth, a protector at the door of my lips. Do not turn my heart to a harmful matter, to be occupied in occupations of wickedness with people who are workers of iniquity, and let me not make a meal of their pleasantries. Let the righteous strike me in kindness and chastise me, oil so heady, let my head not refuse, for still is my prayer against their harm making. Having slipped down because of a rock are their judges, and they heard my declarations, for they were pleasing. As one loosens and breaks up the earth, scattered were our bones at the mouth of Sheol. For to you, Adonai, my supreme, are my eyes, in you I have taken refuge. Do not pour out my soul. Guard me from the snare that they have trapped for me and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into his own net together. I am forever will I pass. And with that, I cannot tell you, I can tell you, there are many different translations to this psalm because it's a very difficult psalm, both in terms of its grammar and in its word order. In that way, I think more than any other psalm that we have learned, particularly that middle part, is a bit elusive. I'm looking up one thing in my concordance that I made a mental note to myself to look up while I was meditating this morning, and I'll come back to it a little bit later. I have a suspicion that I need to check. So we'll start at the beginning. Adonai, I have called you. Hushali, hasten to me, give ear to my voice when I call you. It opens with urgency. The word husha, hasten to me, is also Psalm 28, 23. And it's this sense again of an immediacy of danger. Ibn Yahya, a commentator of an early of the Middle Ages will say regarding koli, my voice, that it is koli because I don't have time to put together my words thoughtfully. Just pay attention, God, to the urgency in my voice. And so verse one, a quality of urgency. 
establish my prayer as incense before you. And in contrast is the opening word, tikkun, is to establish, to play. So if verse 1 has this sense of motion, of urgency, the contrast with the opening verb in verse 2 is to be fixed. Let my prayer be fixed as incense before you. Incense, there's a lot of commentaries in the classical commentaries about the choice here of the word incense. Incense is in Proverbs, the statement that incense, Proverbs 27, 9, ointment and incense rejoice the heart. And in the Midrash and Tanhuma, that'll be applied to God as well. And I highlight this quote from Proverbs because we're going to come to the oil in a moment. Raising of my palms, an offering of evening. And the commentators will emphasize that it is not in place of those offerings. It's in addition or in this moment. Some would point to verse 2 as saying that this is a prayer of a Kohen, for it was the Kohen who brought the incense offering before God. And in that sense, there's a sense of familiarity. The incense offering was placed on a golden altar within the tabernacle itself. Only the Kohen could go there. The Talmud will say of the incense offering, that it is an offering for misuse of tongue, offered in privacy. The Kohen is alone in that chamber. Yoma 44a and Arichin 16a refer to this incense offering, which was also distinctly communal. The raising of palms is that image also of the Kohen who would raise palms to bless the people, a figure, an image that's often you'll see on gravestones of blessing, but here also of service to God. And now three and four, part B of the opening section. Place Adonai a guard for my mouth, a protector at the door of my lips. And again, that's a unique image that one should, that God should have the immediacy of presence, of having placed a guard. And here, there will be a bifurcation, a difference between commentators where Malbim will say that this is a continuation of verse 1 and 2. Malbim who lived in 19th century Ukraine, will say that place out of my guard from mouth, protect at the door of my lips, meaning pay close attention, catch, if you will, my words as they emerge with a quality of immediacy of attention. So verse 3 for the Malbim goes in the first unit. But for most, it's the beginning of it's a, it, it links to verse 4. Do not turn my heart to a harmful man, matter. And again, ledavar can also be to a harmful word. And there's a repetition in the Hebrew, lihit olel alilot, also kind of a rare choice of words. I, I do it in the English to demonstrate that play on the repetition of the word to be occupied in occupations, Russia of wickedness, with people who are po'ale aven, workers of iniquity, a phrase that will reoccur in verse 9, workers of iniquity. And here's a word of a, a phrase that's ambiguous. Uval elham b'man and let me not make a meal of their pleasantries, is my translation. Here's some other ways that it gets translated. The word 
is again a very unusual word. El Cham can be understood as lechem, bread. So it gets translated as in the art scroll, and let me not break bread of their delicious feasts. The root can also, el ham, instead of being bread, can be milchama, war. And therefore, Richard Levy translates it, and let me not struggle to eat their delicacies, meaning let me not be tempted, let me not struggle with myself to want to eat their pleasantries. In either case, there's a sense of socializing can lead to closeness, can lead to following the ways of the workers of iniquity. Let me not be tempted by their pleasantries, which will have this word reappear here in verse 6, na'emu, pleasing. Pleasantries is a word I've chosen with a kind of double entendre, namely pleasantries of their delicious foods. That's how many will translate it. Or pleasantries in terms of, you know, a meal of their pleasantries with their banter, with their enjoyable conversation that is seeped in slander. And now for the confusion. First part is not so confusing. Let the righteous strike me in kindness and chastise me. Now that can sound a little confusing, strike me in kindness. You know, it says in Leviticus 19:17, Hochiach tochiach et amitecha, you shall surely chastise your neighbor. And then it will say, and you shall love your neighbors yourself. But before you get to love your neighbors yourself, the commentators will say that one must be willing to chastise and to receive chastisement. And so that's part two of five. Oil so heady, let my head not refuse. The Hebrew is far more obscure. Shemen rosh, oil of head, al yani roshi, the word yani appears nowhere else. Do not something yani my head, um, usually understood as refuse. Oil is understood by the rabbis as a sign of one giving over power. That's how a king would be given power, but it's also that which repairs the skin. It's seen as healing. And so may the words Radak will say of chastisement heal my character the way that oil heals my body. And then this last phrase, also a bit obscure, ki od ut filati baraotehem, I translate, for still is my prayer against their harm making. So even though I'm being chastised, my prayer remains, and that's why I'm receiving chastisement as if it was oil on my head, because my prayer is against their harm making. I have stayed steadfast. Richard Levy will translate this as, let not my head halt such heady oil. The next line that's obscure, as one loosens and breaks up the earth, scattered were our bones at the mouth of Sheol. Now, I'll add that Robert Alter in particular sees this as a text that is corrupted, so that in verse 6, oh, I, I skipped a line, I'm sorry, verse 6, then I'll get to verse 7. 
having slipped down because of a rock are their judges and they heard my declarations for they were pleasing. Um, again, all the words here are a little obscure in terms of grammar, content. It's not clear what this rock is and if, who's, if they're slipping down the rock or because of the rock, if the judges are leaders or judges. Rashi will say this can refer to Aaron and Moses who had their downfall because of a rock or a rock is a metaphor for that which is cold, which is the equivalent of cruel. So they have slipped down because they were cold and cruel. And they heard my declarations for they were pleasing. Again, it's not clear what the flow is. It's often understood back to Rashi because of his importance. This is King David saying, they were corrupt, those leaders around me, but I continue to teach them the pleasing ways of Torah. This is David who, as you will see, he's not asking in this case, there's the possibility that he is speaking to the leaders with pleasing words. And verse 7, the end of this confusing section, as when one loosens and breaks up the earth, scattered were our bones at the mouth of Sheol. In the Septuagint, it's instead of our bones, scattered were their bones at the mouth of Sheol. I was beginning to say that Robert Alter sees this middle section, five, six, and seven, as particularly convoluted due to scribal error. So he would see, for instance, the word in verse six, Sela, rock, as belonging in verse seven, as one loosens and as when one loosens a rock and breaks up the earth. That got slipped here. Um, he feels that way it would flow better. Having slipped down, are the judges. Here's another example of where he will say five, six, and seven are scribal errors. I shared Alyoni Roshi, let my head not refuse. He would say instead of Shemen Rosh, oil so heady, it would be Shemen Rasha, if you change the word around a bit. So the oil of the evil. Okay, last section. For to you, Adonai, my supreme, are my eyes, and you I have taken refuge. Do not pour out my soul. So back to dependency on God. That's where the psalm began. Now it reverts. I'm looking to you, but instead of focus on mouth, it's on your eyes. I have taken refuge. And this phrase, all to our nafshi, do not pour out my soul, can either mean do not let me die, right? My soul leave my body. Martin Cohen translates it as expose not my soul to harm, which is similar to others. So it's not clear, do not pour out my soul, meaning do not leave me defenseless or do not let me die. Guard me from the snare that they have trapped for me and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. And so now a new element. It's similar to Psalm 140 of yesterday, that they set traps for me. Last verse, let the wicked fall into his own net together. And that last phrase, again, is like yesterday. What midah keneged midah, what they sought to do to me, set a trap for me. Let that happen to them. Let them fall in the trap. That's a theme we have seen elsewhere in Psalms as well. Also Psalm 35, 8, Psalm 1, 4. And then I was looking in the concordance for this last line. Because my hunch is, so I'm scanning my concordance, that the word anochi is very rare. It, I see, only occurs four times in Psalms. And here it is at the end. 
Anochi. That's the first word of the Ten Commandments. I am. And then Ad Avor, forever will I pass, is also understood as until I pass, while I pass through, I alone shall go on. So to pull it together, Anochi ad evor. Let the wicked fall into his own net together. Let all of them fall in together. But then Anochi, I am. Now I read it as a statement of confidence. As it opens with confidence, it opens with my words can be like incense before you. My palms can be like an offering of evening because I have not fallen into their traps. I have not been swayed by their delicacies of conversation and food. I am. Forever will I pass, meaning I'm not going to fall for their wily ways. In that regard, I find Psalm 141, which we do have other psalms, as an expression of vulnerability. I know that I can be tempted. Therefore, set a guard at my lips, and yet... I'm not falling for their wily ways. I can manage God with your with your help. So Benjamin Siegel says, what's the flow? It can be, in terms of these three sections, that the psalmist acknowledges that he's tempted by evildoers even as they hunt him. That's taking it all as a unit. Or it can be they have failed to tempt me with words, and then they laid traps for me. That's another possible flow. And they fell into their own traps. Or that the entire psalm is about temptations. For me, I choose to read the jumbled nature of 5, 6, and 7 as, if you will, the disorientation that the psalmist wishes to convey poetically. Having slipped, it's five, six, and seven. Let the righteous strike me in kindness and chastise me. So he's already acknowledging that he seeks not only for God to help him, he seeks for those who he sees as worthy of goodness, to, to chastise him, to let him know when he's doing the improper, and may it be like oil on my head, meaning something that is both empowering and beautiful and healing. For my prayers remain against those who harm, they who have slipped down, and maybe there's the allusion to even with this rock, that rocks are slippery, rocks are hard and cold, or maybe Moses and Aaron and they heard my declarations, but I continued. Here's this continuity. Even with them who surround me, who are slipping on these rocks, I think of wet rocks and how slippery they are. I, and it's at the center of this, remain faithful to you, aware of needing to speak pleasantly. My declarations were pleasing. I wasn't engaging in slander. As when one loosens and breaks up the earth, scattered were our bones at the mouth of Sha'ol. Here there's that grin, that sense of danger, where the bones were at the pit of the grave, scattered. It's not clear what this is referring to. Is it, as some would say, a battle that was lost? Or is it simply an image of such danger it was we were on the cusp of the grave in the past? And here it's in the plural, as if it's the society at large that somehow was in havoc. And so that too, five six and seven with the mix of the in, of the I and the we is confusing and the question remains is it intentionally so or is it due to scribal errors 
my bias is to choose to believe it's purposeful. After all, part one and part three, the language is relatively clear. It's only in the middle that it's jumbled. And my sense is that's part of the message. That when everything seems jumbled at the core of this prayer, nonetheless, as it opens and closes, nonetheless, my words can be like incense to you. Because even though it's jumbled, I'm not falling down. I'm not being, I'm not being lured into misuse of my tongue. And therefore, I know you will guard me from their traps of all kinds and that they will fall into their own traps. I am anochi, a statement of firm presence, rarely used in Psalms, only four times at a glance out of 150 Psalms. I am ad evor, forever will I pass. Again, elliptical, I will pass without falling into their traps of misuse of tongue. And so I revel in the jumbled nature of the middle of this psalm, seeing the middle as suggestive of a trap, of that which is loose, that you can fall into, that loose earth described in verse 7, where it's as if, you know, you're at the edge of a grave, the grave being the loose earth around the pit of misuse of tongue, of joining with those who speak ill. And so in sum, Psalm 141, place Adonai a guard for my mouth, a prayer to God to guard tongue, a prayer for God to encourage fellow good people to be a check and simultaneously amidst that vulnerability, a quality of remarkable and unusual expression of both the power of words to be like incense to God and more, his own confidence that he has not fallen into the pit, but forever will I pass. Anochi, I am. And so with that, a difficult psalm, and I think a very rich psalm. And again, we honor Raz Ru, and I'll come back to saying a word about Raz and why I asked her to be my honoree, not knowing what the psalm was going to really talk about. Frankly, uh, each of the psalms are, for me, new. This is a Psalm 141 that I really had not read before. It's not in our liturgy. And in many um, translations in the Jewish tradition, the middle three verses are often not translated because they're so jumbled. <laughs> and again, I'm just fascinated and choose to see it as purposeful. With that, some reactions to Psalm 141. Howard, go ahead. You got to unmute, Howard. Two quick thoughts. Number one, the whole idea of chastise. The great teachers and also great parents are able to point out flaws in their children, but it's about the behavior, not the human being. So it's not destruction. So the whole idea to chastise, the great teachers can do that without making us feel devastated at any level. And I was intrigued by when you said the Christians use the prayer regarding incense and we Jews do not. Could that have anything to do, Rabbi, with we are not supposed to, if I understand, light incense after the destruction of the temples? So two thoughts, I'll, okay. I'll do them in reverse order. When I was, Wikipedia is such a valuable resource for me and it has an entry for every Psalm. And that's where I gain the insight of how a Psalm is used in Christianity and in larger culture and literature. And they link the use of this Psalm, particularly in the Orthodox 
Christian community, which is very incense heavy to evening prayers. So I do think that that for them is a prompt of this psalm, the incense evening. And like you say, Howard, in the Jewish tradition, for the rabbis, part of the penalty of destruction is that we remind ourselves of Khorban Abayit, the destruction of the house, by not having some of the pleasures and the experiences of the temple, which includes incense. Um, I, I learned something interesting about incense, which is an aside in preparing this psalm that I never knew, and that is incense has in it something that's not kosher per se, and that's Maimonides points out that incense should include bull blood as one of the elements. Blood itself is not something we're permitted to eat per se. And incense, were, there were many um, elements to the incense, including another quality of incense that was not fragrant by itself. And incense in some becomes an offering to God of a unique quality. The other thing you touched on is the wisdom teaching of the need for chastisement. The masters will say in the Jewish tradition, you can only chastise another if you can do it with compassion, out of love. And there's a statement in, which is hard to do, because if you're going to chastise, it's usually because you're upset by somebody. And the rabbis will say, well, that's not when it says in Leviticus, um, you shall surely chastise your neighbor. And then the next verse is love your neighbors yourself. They'll link the two and they'll say you can only chastise with the mindset of loving as if it was the way you could hear it. In, in Proverbs 27.5, Tov tochachot megula, better are chastisements revealed ma'ahava misutarit, than love that is hidden. Meaning, better for, it's better to be chastised openly than for somebody to say, well, I love them in my heart. And so, back to wisdom, Proverbs, Jewish wisdom teachings, chastisement, an act of love when done lovingly. Other, other reactions, Julia and then Deidre? You have to make yourself a little louder, Julia. Sorry. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Is that okay? That's good. I, I loved the the psychological kind of reconciliation of the jumbling, um, and it reminds me there, there's similar passages at you know that editors puzzle over in Shakespeare, especially in his later dramas where his his writing gets very convoluted. And there's a lot of argument about whether is that convolution meant to psychologically express that character at that moment, you know, where we often can't even follow the grammar, or is this because Shakespeare is just kind of getting crazy with his writing? And, and the possibility of error is also introduced, like is this, a, a, you know, a typesetter trying to make sense of something that didn't make sense to him when he read whatever text he was composing. Um, so anyway, I just thought it was a great, I loved how you put all that together and it was very resonant with this oh. other, you know, semi-sacred text that I <laughs> devoted my life to. <laughs> well, thank you, Julia. It um, is gratifying to have you see that as not only a worthy understanding of this psalm, but something that occurs in great literature as well as something purposeful to say, you, because again, what's so dramatic here is the clarity before and after, and it's about words before and traps after and needing to be chastised. And there's that swirling sense of not finding the words and finding the grammar that creates a quality that is the message. Yeah. Deidre? This psalm is amazing. I'm about to just pop with how many things came to mind. So I have a suggestion, may it please the court, that this psalm could be read as 
either by the communal nation of Israel or about this, like in the same way that we read Isaiah 53 as being about the communal nation, um, supporting evidence. The first verse has the ha'azinu. That's literally the exact phrasing that Moshe uses towards the people at the end of his tenure as their leader. And accepting prayers as incense, even the sages talk about how, you know, in the absence of a temple, we substitute prayers as an incense or something that we offer up to God in lieu of having physical offerings. And when it was discussing in verse four about making a meal with workers of iniquity and becoming, you know, compatriots with them and it leading you kind of into their ways, that's similar to the children when they were uh, at the plains of Moab. After the whole Balak and Balaam incident, they sat down and ate and had festivities with the Moabites, and that's what led them astray. And the next verse talks about the oil, and it reminded me of the psalm where it talks about the oil dripping down Aaron's beard and how you know beautiful that was. And the proverb that you quoted also reminded me of uh, the wounds of a friend are faithful, you know? So when someone that you know is chastising you, you know, because they want you to be better, they know you can be better. So they're enriching you. And oil is also what you would anoint um, the kings with and prophets to choose them. So, you know, God choosing his people and continuing to enable them to be better when he chastises them. Um, the, the bones being scattered at the mouth of shale reminded me of the prophet where it talks about the valley of dry bones and then it gets knit together with the tendons and the muscles and then it becomes a people again. So, you know, restoration of a people, even though they may have been wounded or scattered before. So like scattered dispersion, exile. Um, the last verse I got really excited about because the root word, um, evor, the root word is um, the same word for Hebrew. And that means to cross over. So, you know, Abraham crossed over from his native land. And so there could be this aspect of despite having gone through good and bad chastisement and being re-enlivened, you continue to be a Hebrew, you continue to cross over. So despite snares, you can step over a snare, you know, much as the, the children of Israel, you know, passed over the different sea and the Jordan River and things like that. And that's so encouraging, you know, to read that. So that's what came to my mind. <laughs> so I'll say a few things in reaction, and then I'll give you, a, I'm going to point to Roz and pull it together. I am delighted, Deidre, by the depth of your familiarity with the Bible and with Hebrew that allows for many associations. And I hear this kind of collage of associations on your part pointing to the collective and pointing in many ways to the future beyond the temple. And all of those suggestions with the opening image of Ha'azinu as Moses addressing the people to the closing word of Avor containing the word Ivri, Hebrew, the one who will pass over, which points both to Abraham he was the Ivri, as well as the Israelites. And that in between are images of the people. Um, with other moments in the history of the moving forward. So it is evocative. And that's, you know, a, a good poem, a good psalm also has this quality of dream analysis. And the power of dream analysis is you can present a dream and what a therapist will do is say, okay, begin to free associate. And then you can have all these associations and it's the associations that are as revealing as, if you will, the text, the dream. And here, the familiarity of images of oil and bones create all kinds of associations that sum up Moses at the mountaintop saying goodbye to moving forward, the closing word, and all in between. So lots of rich associations for which I thank you. 
Roz, I asked you to join, although you, often I look at the screen and I think everybody who's on has had the opportunity to be honored at this point. And that makes me happy because it gives me added motivation and satisfaction in having somebody to focus on as part of the celebration of study. And mostly because I missed you, Roz, in this time in which people weren't physically together. And I identify you with all the goodness of CBI in terms of a caregiver, usually behind the scenes for our community that I felt the need to kind of pop you into the foreground and honoring you with this psalm. Any thoughts as you listen in, Roz? You don't need to, but any thoughts about the study today? No, which is appropriate as well because I didn't, and I said this as I wrote to Roz briefly, no expectation to speak. And one of the things I identify you with, Roz, is somebody who chooses your words carefully and wisely. And the best choice is often silence. So <laughs> that seems appropriate at the end of this psalm as well.